anyway, welcome back to my vlog. Chapter 12 of Laugh and Live by Douglas Fairbanks. Physical and mental preparedness. It is not the object of this chapter to deal with the set course of physical culture, but rather to emphasize the necessity of keeping our physical house in order. There are plenty of books on physical culture which can be relied upon, and also any number of physical instructors who are able to advise and help along a set program. There are hundreds of places, institutions, clubs, YMCAs, and the like, which provide gymnasiums and every other facility for those who determine to build themselves up through consistent physical exercise. That is all very well to begin with, but afterward we must have some simple methods of our own which will not make it a hardship or a chore to keep ourselves in trim, a state of physical preparedness. It should become a part of our daily scheme to obtain certain simple rules which tend toward an automatic effort instead of a discipline, and we should persevere in these until they become fixed habits. It is no trouble at all to take, ex to take exercise unconsciously, and we only arrive at this by turning into an exercise any of our ordinary physical actions during the day as we go along. For instance, we can sit down in a chair, and in so doing, can add a certain amount of exercise to the action itself, also in rising. With very little effort, we can come into the habit of sitting correctly, posing the body as it should be, holding the shoulders in proper position, also the chin, so that it becomes a hardship to sit improperly. All of this has to do with general physique. In walking, we can go along with a spring, elasticity, and vigor of motion, which forces a fine blood circulation throughout the entire system. We can stoop over in the act of picking up some object from the floor and at the same time make it a matter of physical exercise, and we may take a hat from the rack while standing away from it, thus stretching ourselves, as it were, into a little needful action. Putting on an overcoat or any part of our clothing may be done in such a way as to set the blood to racing through the body. Morning and night, upon getting up and upon retiring, there is every reason to make it a rule to exercise freely. The morning exercise wakes us up and sits us down finally at the breakfast table with a zest for the food before us. The morning bath is an agency for good in this direction after we have given ourselves a good shake up from head to foot. By the same token, exercises at night before retiring induces sound sleep and takes away the strain of the preceding day. A very successful system is that of exercising in bed instead of immediately jumping to the floor in the morning, it is very inviting to go through some simple form of gymnastics in which the physical structure is brought into play. Physical exercise is something which can be carried to extremes. We can go at the work so intensely that we become muscle bound and develop some structural enlargements that we do not need. This happens very often among athletes. The ordinary man should fight shy of such plans. Superfluous strength is only for those who have need of it. What we really want is strength enough to carry us through our daily rounds with comfort and a feeling of efficiency. In a sense, we all live by our wits, and these decline when not properly fed by our general physical organization. Prize fighters are not the longest lived people, nor are the professional athletes. Their calling requires extra building up, which would be a positive handicap to the average man whose manner of life doesn't require this super development. In other words, there are intemperate methods of exercising just as there are of eating and drinking. We may easily go too far. Again, we can sin just as greatly by not going far enough. There was a time when men of 40 were as worn and old as men of 65 and 70 are today. As a matter of fact, nowadays a half-century mark is no longer a badge of senility when a man has kept himself fit and treated himself right. We all have friends who are pretty well along in years by virtue of their carefully planned physical training plus their cheerful disposition. They're, they are as sprightly and companionable as, those, as, the, as though they were many years younger. We should come to know early in life what a large part good humor plays in physical fitness. In previous chapters, hearty laughter was extolled as one of the very best of exercises. It is an organizer in itself and opens up the heart and lungs as nothing else will do. It makes the blood go galloping all through the system. It is one of the best automatic blood circulators in the business. Laughter takes the stress off of the mind, and whatever is ahead of us for the day that seems likely to become a burden is soon turned into an ordinary circumstance. We smile as we go about doing it. A friend once said to a banker, 
How do you know when to lend money? The banker replied, I look a man in the eye and then I do or I don't. The banker, uh, the friend said, I would like to borrow $10,000 now. You shall have it, sir, the banker replied. This meant that the man who asked for the loan was in a state of physical and mental preparedness. If he had gone into the banker's office looking like an animated tombstone, he wouldn't have had much of a chance to borrow the 10000 It goes without saying that the open-faced, hearty fellow inspires confidence. There is nothing coming to the dried-up, sour chap, and that's what he usually gets. And what we get is largely a matter of our physical well-being. A modern philosopher observed that the blues are the product of bad livers. And there is no doubt but that he was right. The problem of life is to fill our days with sunshine. In so doing, we shall find that the little graces are those which will lend us the most help. Tiny favors extended, words of encouragement, courtesies of all sorts, unselfish work carried out in an open manner, true friend friendships and love, a hearty laugh, a sincere appreciation of the other fellow's struggle to keep his head above water, the conscientious carrying out of all tasks assigned us. These are our helpmates, and they are the products of our physical and mental equipment. Through these, we come into the, our knack of detecting friends among those, those who are the salt of the earth. It is impossible for the person who desires good health to obtain it, or having it, to retain it, without consistent effort. A watch will not run without the proper regulation of the mainspring. We must keep up our activities. We have taken the earth and are turning it into something to serve us, Therefore, the need of fine bodily preparedness. Nothing can take the place of achievement, and it comes through physical and mental efficiency. The one must not be neglected for the other. Both must be cultivated and developed alike in order that each may help the other. Happiness comes only to those who take care of themselves. It is the natural product of clean-mindedness. No pleasure can surpass that of a conscious feeling of our strength of character. It is an all-important element in men who aspire to succeed. The man who rises in the morning from a healthy slumber and plunges into the bath after some vigorous exercise is prepared to undertake anything. His world seems fair, and though the sun may not be shining literally, it is to all intents and purposes. Or, it is to all intents and purposes. Thus, we go swinging along with a cheery smile, carrying the message of hope and joy to all those with whom we come in contact. Oh, it's fine to be physically and mentally fit and to make it a great day. And bye for now.